Thank you for having me. Um, I'm honoured to be asked to present on uh, ACLs, which is my passion. Um, I've decided to present on uh, five common pitfalls in the rehab process that I see regularly. Um, so here we go. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, I've worked in the NHS. Uh, I now work privately and I've worked in sport too. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a clinical manager. I manage a very busy sports medicine clinic in, in London. Uh, I specialise in most things, uh, lower body and knee injury, but my real passion is ACLs, um, especially decision making, non-operative non versus operative management and return to sport. And I see anything between 20 and 30 full uh, rehabilitations a year that uh, can include multi-ligaments, revisions, uh, isolated ACLs and everything in between. The aims of the session today are to highlight these five key, key pitfalls that I see, uh, to discuss the evidence around some of these five key pitfalls and to show some strategies I use every day in clinic to avoid these and optimise the patient's recovery. So just to highlight the five key pitfalls that I'm going to talk about today, these are not exclusive. There are many others, um, but these are just the ones I chose to talk about today. The first is just pushing too hard at the start, not regaining uh, full knee extension, not including open chain exercises. I'll largely focus on quadricep exercises today, uh, not using patient reported outcome measures, and finally, not completing the end stage rehab and return to sport testing. So firstly, pushing too hard too soon. So uh, I just uh, put this picture up because this is classically what I see when I see a patient for a, a consultant uh, appointment, perhaps, you know, three, four weeks down the line. Um, and they've just got this inflamed knee that they haven't managed to calm down. And as such, normally they come with an extension deficit. What constitutes pushing too hard? So I've highlighted some things that I think constitutes pushing too hard. Uh, Often I see them off crutches far too soon. Their gait is not normal. They're limping still. Uh, they're putting far too much weight on the good leg and they haven't managed to restore extension, which means they're limping. They often have stopped pain relief because they're not suffering with pain all the time or pain is minimal, but as such, they're still not doing their exercises fully. Uh, they're overdoing hamstring exercises too early or they're pushing into hyperextension far, far too soon whilst the front of the knee isn't settled down. Um, they they tend to push exercises through pain or through swelling um, they, and they also may push that um, exercises to the point where the, the swelling increases after activity. Um, those that choose to strength train too soon are also commonly pushing far too hard. We need to make sure we have adequate uh, range of motion. We need to make sure the wounds are calmed down. We're, we're not dealing with any infections. The patella is mobile. And we've got adequate quad function before we really start to focus on pure strength training. And another classic is running on a swollen knee. I've chose to uh, make this little diagram. This is self uh, self designed, so you can uh, quote me on this if you like. But this is just that early phase ACL cycle of doom. Uh, I would tend to start up here, pain, foot with swelling. Then they get this extension lag because they're worried or it's painful to push their knee back straight. As a result, the quads get weak. Then you start to see muscle atrophy that continues far too long. And as such, they limp. And then what happens is they keep pushing and they just go round and round and round this loop. And what we want to try to do is break this cycle so that we can get them rehabilitating, full rehabilitating at an appropriate level. And as such, making sure that they can move through their phases. The second pitfall I've chosen to talk about today is not regaining full knee extension. And as you can see, this patient has got one of those knees that looks like it's pitching a tent. The questions I often get asked about knee extension, which I think are important to tackle around this. Surely zero is enough. In my opinion, zero is not enough. Um, we need to be aiming for symmetrical extension compared to the other side. We do need to find the right time to push into hyperextension. But if the patient is unable to get uh, what they would deem their normal extension, this, this can be a problem. Sometimes we do settle for a few degrees off of their, their previous level, but we will a always aim to restore their normal extension. When is the right time to push hyperextension, if at all? So I've already sort of answered that. Yes, we do push into hyperextension appropriately, uh, but we need to make sure the front of the knee is calm so that we don't risk flaring up the fat pad um, or uh, pushing too soon. 
Uh, what might be affecting me reaching full extension? This can, if you haven't managed to get there early on in the process, if you haven't uh, enabled the need to calm down, it could be swelling, it could be uh, the fat pad is irritated, or you could be suffering from something uh, called a cyclops lesion or, or, or arthrofibrosis, if that's much further down the line. Um, and, and it's key to make sure that we we optimize their rehab so that we don't we don't get to that point. And how quickly do we need to be restoring extension? Ideally, we want zero as quickly as possible, but certainly within the first four to six weeks. And the reason for that is the research suggests if we don't uh, restore extension to zero by four weeks, we increase the chance of suffering. This is a cyclops lesion scarring around the ACL or just arthroid fibrosis. This can be normally around the sort of fat bad region or, or, or within, within the knee restricting knee function. So we need to make sure we restore extension early I'm not necessarily saying in the first four weeks you're pushing into hyperextension, but we certainly want to be seeing that patient able to recruit their quads and get to zero early doors in their rehab. And the problem is, if we don't, we know it will slow down their rehab overall. And generally, especially if they end up having uh, further surgery, for things like arthrofibrosis or, uh, or cyclops lesions as such, they're going to have uh, worse outcomes overall. Okay. This is a image I've got from one of my patients. This is something I use commonly when we're trying to restore knee extension. This lady, unfortunately, came to me uh, around 10 weeks down the line. Um, she initially turned up with uh, a, a maximum flexion of uh, 85 degrees, and she could only reach around 15 degrees knee extension. Uh, we swiftly whisked her off to a, a surgical colleague of mine who unfortunately identi identified some arthrofibrosis. Um, she had to have a secondary surgery to clear the arthrofibrosis, which was done arthroscopically, and she came to see me afterwards. Here we're using an elevated band-assisted extension alongside muscle stimulation to try to recruit those quadriceps that have been asleep for that whole period of time. Now, we didn't do this straight away. As you can see, she's not got any wound dressings on. Um, they're all well healed, and you can see there isn't any obvious huge amounts of swelling around the fat pad. So you have to pick the right time to do this. Um, but those strategies that are important from the start, as long as you don't end up in the situation this lady did, early swelling management, managing pain appropriately, you know, using your crutches, using appropriate pain relief to allow you to move and optimize uh, your function. Restoration of walking gait is essential. I find people skip this far too much. You need to restore normal gait with crutches and you need to make sure you use gait drills to ensure they're using the correct processes. Quads activation, as you can see, I like muscle stim. I think this is important and those uh, from the Delaware Oslo group would say you need to use it until they have quads function of around 80%. And finally, as point one, not going too hard too quickly. Allow the knee to recover and gradually bring that down, but don't wait too long. Settle the swelling, use pain relief, and you should be fine. Pitfall three that I wanted to talk about today is not including open chain knee exercises. This is classic. I hear this a lot. This is, seems to be a, a common debate. And if you, uh, you can see uh, lots of clinicians talking about not using open chain leg extension exercises. Uh, and I think this is something that seems to be we're holding on to this far too long and the evidence doesn't suggest we need to. So why might people avoid them? Uh, fear of in increasing laxity. I'd say this is this is the number one point and this is the one that gets raised the most. Um, number two, risk on damaging the surgical fixation. Number three, fear of pain around the front of the knee. I've just put PF, uh, PFJ, but we could be talking Hoffer's fat pad or, or sort of um, wound site pain. Um, and thinking that closed chain exercises will restore full quads function. So I have some uh, combating arguments for the for these points. Uh, sorry, and finally, uh, because they're told not to by the consultant. Now, what does the evidence say? Uh, I'll, so the evidence says the fear of uh, increasing laxity via strain, as you can see, that there is no evidence showing the increased laxity for op open kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain group when compared by a study done in 2018. And this is if applied appropriately. I don't mean from uh, day one. This is making sure you use the correct strategies to bring in the open chain knee extension exercises. Now, if you want to find a, a safe protocol for incorporating those, this second um, uh, article here for Kuda et al. 2013 proposes a way of 
bringing those in safely for a graded approach, starting with isometrics and gradually bringing them up to isotonic with initially with a restricted range of motion. But that's something that uh, you can look into if you're interested. But I would certainly encourage you to to bring these in uh, appropriately early. Um, the fear of PFJ related pain or anterior knee pain uh, or Hoffa's fat pad irritation from open chain exercises Certainly, there is more quadricep usage and there is more pressure through the front of the knee when you do this. But if you apply closed kinetic chain exercises such as a squat or a deadlift or a leg press too early, then you can all easily irritate the front of the knee too. So it's all about applying the load and the exercises correctly and at the right time. Uh, and I think if you hold away from open kinetic chain, you, you won't be getting quads like this guy on the right hand side of your screen. Um Fine, the final two, thinking closed chain exercises restore full, full quads function. Uh, this article here by Lepley, um, 2015, shows that um, closed kinetic chain exercises, especially in ACL reconstruction uh, patients, do not uh, restore full quadricep strength. Um, and if they if they manage to get very close, it takes a long time. So if you can bring in those open chain leg extension exercises that you can do at gym, you will recover your quads both faster uh, and likely get much closer to that 100% what we're aiming for. Finally, I think the first four points should help negate the problem uh, if, unfortunately, you're told not to. Uh, and finally, bodybuilders know a thing or two about building muscle. They use isolation movements. If we're trying to build muscle, Let's take tips from those that do it best. Final pitfall four, uh, not using, uh, sorry, pitfall four, not using uh, patient reported outcome measures. Now I've just, these are just some of those that are available, the IKDC, uh, the COOS uh, and, a, and the ACLRSI. Now these measures are important because psychology matters. Now I left, uh, I, I made this uh, talk a while ago, but I left Tiger here because he's going through some real struggles and hopefully um, he recovers well. Uh, but he admittedly had his problems with returning from back surgeries and such as a result of um, his general feelings about his back and his confidence to hit certain shots. And this is these sorts of things are true in ACL patients as well. You know, though we know that psychological read, readiness is, is a way of predicting how well people will do when they come back from these injuries. Uh, we know that fear of re-injury um, reduced knee uh, self-efficacy are also associated with poor functional um, restoration uh, and as such return to sport final one pitfall five um this is kind of two points i've managed to sort of push into the same point i suppose that's cheating um but i decided to talk about not completing end-stage rehab and, and and as such not testing your patient appropriately now this picture on the left shows uh, the sort of traditional Return to sports testing. I realise it doesn't have a picture of strength, but the, the four sort of hop measures that we see regularly. And this picture on the right is just a little snapshot of on-field rehab. This is this is or, or on-field testing, sorry. And this is something that where I think we need to go. So the picture on the left is not return to sports testing. It may make a a snapshot. It may help guide you about whether people are ready to go to end stage rehab. But this is not sports specific. It can be part of that assessment. But this should not be how we make the decisions about whether this patient returns to sport. And the reasons for that is we need to determine if they are ready by testing all facets of their performance, not just hopping and limb symmetry index. We need to look at how they move under sporting conditions, under sporting intensity. And this is why on-field rehabilitation is essential. We need to get them in the environment that they are going to return to. And if we don't, we are, we are allowing that patient an opportunity to fail. Fitness is often underestimated in this um, uh, cohort. We need to get them back to the physical demands of the sport they are going to return to. You know, we know that elite uh, soccer players, for instance, can play anything, can run anything between sort of nine and, and, and 13 kilometres per game, and most of which is under sprints and short intervals. So we need to prepare them for that. And as such, I, uh, I know... Uh, this article by Buckthorpe in 2019 really covers those pillars of restoring somebody ready to get back to sport. We need movement quality. They need to move well. They need to be physically conditioned for the activity they're going to get back to. And you need to make sure you've practiced sport specific skills. This could be turning, this can be cutting, football drills, heading, landing, that sort of stuff. 
Uh, and then you need to make sure that you've restored that sort of chronic load. You need to make sure you've got them ready to play games and start to begin to be involved with the squad. Finally, in summary, uh, we need to try to avoid by uh, try to avoid these five key pitfalls, and I guarantee your rehab will be uh, better than the average. With around thirty percent of those that have had ACL uh, re ruptures, uh, avoiding these uh, these key pitfalls should allow us to re reduce those numbers long term. And completing the journey, end stage rehab, good robust testing procedures that are not just hopping and, and strength measures, but include um, sport specific testing and fitness drills um, should allow us to continue to progress. And hopefully we can uh, prevent some of uh, these 30 percent re-ruptures and, and hopefully I'll see less and less revisions as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you for having me.